Thank you kindly for that warm introduction and uh, welcome everyone here. Uh, I'm probably one of the few speakers to get to say that because you're 500 meters from where I live, so thank you for coming to me. Uh, um, I thought it would be a good day to kick off this uh, presentation on Oslo Elm Day by talking about the reasons why I like Elm. And this is a uh, uh, admittedly small and uh, simple and perhaps stupidly simple example about why I like Elm. There are no type definitions in this example. Uh, there are no meaningful names. And yet, uh, all the people in the room who knows Elm reasonably well knows exactly what types are involved and exactly what functionality this thing provides. There is no interface you can implement which changes the definition of record update. There is no implicit function you can implement which uh, changes the definition of what plus does. We know that foo works on records. We know that bar has to be a number. Uh, we know that list map, in the case of XYCA, we know that A is a list of records because foo takes records and returns a new record and list map only ever works with lists. There is no other possible thing this can be. It is very concrete and easy to understand despite the uh, context around these lines of code. There is a problem with this though and that is what I like to call the extensibility problem and is what I'm gonna be talking about today. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Robin Hansen. I normally work for Beck as a consultant and through that arrangement, I work at the NSB, or the uh, Norwegian State Railways, which my colleague Jonas will be talking about in the next room after this. So if you want to know how we use Elm on a day-to-day -day basis and how we introduced Elm at that company, you should definitely check out his talk. I won't be talking that much about NSB. I will instead be talking about my own hobby projects, because that's the sort of person I am. Uh, a couple of years ago, I didn't work as a full-time developer. I did it on a hobby basis. Uh, and I worked part-time at an escape room called House of Secrets. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the concept of an escape room, it's a room you get locked in with your friends uh, for fun. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you are presented with a set of puzzles. And when you solve those puzzles, you get out of the room. And if you don't solve it within an hour, you also get out. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but it's a fun way to spend an, after, to spend an hour on a Saturday night um, and to test your mind a bit. But uh, as is usually the case, you usually get stuck inside that room on some puzzle that you just don't understand how to solve. And to help players along, we would send them hints. So on the left side of the screen, there's the admin interface, which the people who worked at the escape room were looking at. And on the right uh, is the view that they would see inside the room normally showing a countdown timer to show how much time they had left and to stress them out as much as humanly possible. Uh, but when we sent a hint, there would be a text message saying you should probably check underneath the math. No one does that for some reason. Um, having used this for a while, we realized that, uh, in general, a lot of people needed help in the exact same places. Uh, and so we ended up spending a lot of time writing in the same hints all the time. So we thought that if we could implement like a suggestion thing, like a search thing, uh, we could save ourselves some time. And we can also run statistics on what hints are actually being used the most and then adjust the room uh, if things were too hard. Uh, so uh, the first implementation I used was to take whatever you wrote into the hint box, uh, divide it up by uh, spaces so you got the words, lowercase all the words, and then see if you got a match through all previously sent hints. Uh, and this worked fine for a while, uh, but after a couple of months and about 100 games, this became very, very slow. We were doing the search on every single input, and it just didn't, it just didn't work. Um, another note is that the machines we were running this code on was probably a decade old, because that costs absolutely no money. So we had pretty bad machines and had to optimize. Luckily, I know a thing or two about optimizing. Um, so my next attempt was to use a dictionary. Uh, when the application started, I took all the hints, I divided all the hints by words, and then created a dictionary where the key in the dictionary was some word, and the value was a list of all the hints you could find that key in. Uh, and then uh, the benefit of this was that you do deduplicated all the common words and all the popular words, and so when you were searching for a substring match, you just had to try to match, find the keys that match, and they were good. Uh, this was noticeably faster, but it was still like you could, in the worst case, take a second before 
you actually got results and before you saw the rest of the keys you entered. So we had to do some more thinking. And an idea that I had was that, well, a dictionary is a sorted binary tree, right? So if you have a, a dictionary containing all the words in the alphabet, you would probably have a word like apple somewhere around here in the lower left region. And a name like Xerox would probably be in this lower right region. So in theory, you could uh, take all the words you have entered in, divide them up, uh, sort them, and then say, give me a new dictionary that only contains keys in this range. So you would get something like this, dramatically reducing the number of keys you would have to search through, and so get better performance. Maybe even better is that instead of creating a new dictionary, you could just start your fold operation somewhere around here and then all the way over there, not creating new things. In theory, that would be much faster. It's just not possible to do. Uh, and the reason is that dictionaries are opaque. Uh, we don't expose, uh, this, is, this is from the standard library, uh, and this is the definition of a dict. And as you can see, we don't actually expose uh, the different constructor values for the custom type of dict. So there's no way to read the structure of a dictionary, and so there's no way to implement that optimization. It just cannot be done. So that leads you to kind of ponder upon why do we use opaque types to begin with. Well, a good thing about opaque types is that you hide implementation details, which incidentally is the problem we have. Uh, but that means you can refactor a code and not break people's code. There's no way to rely on the internals. If the internals change, that doesn't necessarily mean you break the code, which is great, because in the transition from Elm 018 to 019, I broke the internals and fixed them. Uh, uh, but no one noticed that, hopefully. I hope so. Um, on the other hand, if you want to create a dictionary and hide implementation, you either have to anticipate all the possible needs people would have that data structure, or you would need to be responsive so that when people say, I want to do this legit thing, you would have to add it. Or you would say, no, I don't want to support that use case and get frustrated users or encourage that people create their alternate version of that dictionary. And uh, Self-balancing trees aren't really that hard. Uh, are really hard to uh, <laughs> to uh, to maintain and and make correct. So, spoiler alert: there are no answers in this talk. This is just like things that I've noticed and struggled with uh, to to make you think about things. So, did we make the right trade-off? I don't know. You decide. We'll talk later. Um, I wanted to show this. This is a snippet from the NSB code base uh, where I think we've done where an opaque type was fitting. Uh, so this is how we represent uh, the price of something in our application. We get a number from the back end, which is the number of cents or euro something costs. And it's very, and so it's just, it's really just an integer, but it's very easy to get that wrong. Like, am I adding $5 to this or am I adding, you know, whatever. So we make sure that you can't actually do that operation as if it was an integer to make sure that the rules are maintained throughout the system. This, I think, is a good case of using opaque types, uh, but I'm, I'm still not certain if we should use opaque types on data structures, because you can't extend them that way. Moving on, uh, this is another hobby project of mine. Uh, there are a couple of people in the room who know me well, and they know that I'm a board game and role-playing game nerd. Uh, so every once in a while, I invite a bunch of friends over uh, to play a role-playing game. And so I wrote this application to help me keep track of which, uh, which one of my friends are playing which character in the game. Uh, and so this application lets me uh, order the characters based on where they're sitting around the table. So to my left, Alexander will be sitting, and he's playing Shannon in this game. And then to the top right, there's Vigdis, who's playing George V. Caffey. And on the top right, I have a minimap, so I can just very easily switch between them based on where they're sitting. Um, and of course, they might not sit the same location every time we play, so I need to be able to drag and drop them around based on where they're sitting. Um, so when we're talking about table positions, to me, that is very naturally an array. Right? Take one index and switch them with this index. It's a very natural match to me. The problem with this, though, is that if I represent something in an array, at some point during this, it has to become a list. 
because the only thing I can render as HTML are lists or actual HTML. Um, and that can be tedious and it can be a problem. It could be a performance problem when you do this enough. Uh, and some might say that, you know, this is what type classes are for. Uh, or interfaces or protocols or whatever type of ad hoc polymorphism you want. Uh, and this is true, like this is a valid use case for that. Got your picture? Okay, good. <laughs> but of course, uh, this is a, you know, this is a proper functional language. So we got first class functions. We could create uh, an HTML library that looks a little bit like this, allowing you to override how you iterate through a structure. Of course, you would still need to provide the function to do so, and so it, there's not a huge difference semantically between calling array.toList and doing this, but at least this way, you're not actually converting from one data structure to another just to render HTML. Uh, and if you want to get ris rid of the list fold uh, or array fold thing, you would have to have something like interfaces. But, but do we want interfaces? Uh, this is this is another fa good uh, like I love this language very much to the point where it's almost like sick uh, and this this is closure for those who don't recognize it uh, so what I'm doing here is just I'm creating some array called a which contains the numbers one two three and then I use conj which means add into essentially uh, and using the number four and that uh, returns a new vector with one, two, three, four, which is like, yeah, that makes sense. That is reasonable. But if I were to call map identity on A, which in theory should return the same or equivalent data structure, and call conj on that, suddenly the new element is added to the front. What? This is, this is a pretty common uh, beginner's problem in Clojure. And the reason is that map actually returns a sequence, which is kind of a list. Um, but, but the end result is that suddenly I need to be aware when I'm calling conj, what am I calling conj on? Uh, it, it, I know it was a vector on this place, but something might have happened in between to make sure it isn't. So now, I mean, it could work, but it's not something like this where every single line makes inherent sense. It's concrete. I know exactly what the things do. I know exactly what the types are. There are no other options. In this case, I could, we could introduce extensibility to allow for a, a pretty valid pattern, but it couldn't be done without changing the semantics of the language drastically. And so we need to, we need to say that, well, that's the thing about the extensibility problem, right? It's no way to solve it without changing things. And so the question should be, is the change something we like? And of course, the question should always be, have we done the right set of trade-offs? I don't know. We'll talk later. Thank you for your time uh, and have, uh, and you know, keep on enjoying the conference. <laughs> Thanks.